before we dig in, a quick thank you to the sponsors ready to grow with the Soil Sisters. Fed and Happy is the official nutrient provider for the Soil Sisters projects because we believe in the Fed and Happy philosophy that if the worms won't eat it, neither will we. And Tejas Tonic is the official beverage of the Texas Soil Sisters. We especially love that the hemp for Tejas Tonic is organically farmed in the Texas Hill Country with farms in both Dripping Springs and Lukenbach, Texas. The Soil Sisters podcast is powered by BNP Electric. Whether you're building, remodeling, installing low voltage landscape lighting, or in need of an inspection, BNP is your Central Texas electrical contractor. Find links to our sponsors in the podcast show notes or head over to txsoilsisters.co. It's planting season. And it's not too late to make sure your crops grow up fed and happy. Regardless of your spring crop, Fed and Happy offers a variety of worm casting solutions in liquid and solid form to supercharge your soil, your yields, and your profitability. For fast, vibrant germination and seedling growth, mix your seed with Fed and Happy's screened granular castings pre-drilling. The Fed and Happy Liquid Seed Treat and Extracts offer the ideal mix of soluble solids loaded with living beneficial biology, mycorrhizal fungi, humates, and more. The Fed and Happy Small Spreadable Castings are ideal for fast, easy soil incorporation. The large offer long-term stability and soil growth. But you don't have to figure this out on your own. Just call 833-GO-WORMS to speak with our farm team experts for a fast turnaround on a custom solution for your needs. Fare better against pests, disease, drought, and other potential hazards this season with Fed and Happy Worm Castings. Visit fedandhappy.com for a healthy harvest and any lawn, garden, and tree care needs. Available for pickup and on-farm delivery. That's fedinhappy.com. Or call 833-GO-WORMS. Happy planting. You're listening to the Soil Sisters podcast, where we dig in on family farming and ranching, regenerative agriculture, healthy living, and planting seeds in our community. We invite you to listen, subscribe, and grow with the Soil Sisters. Hi, y'all. I'm Joe. Welcome to the Soil Sisters podcast. I am joined by my blood, soul, and soil sister, Crystal. (laughs) And we are so thrilled today to have Dax Hansen. He is the current steward of the Oatman Flats Ranch, his family ranch in Arizona. And he is the founder of Oatman Farms. Dax, thank you so much for driving all the way out to Lockhart, Texas to hang out with us. My pleasure. I'll I'll do it again. Yay. Yeah, he wants to be a resident, so. Come on. (laughs) Let's find some land Reminds me a little bit of um, like Boo Radley and uh, that (laughs) sort of uh, town growing up with ghosts around. Mm -hmm. And this would be a fun place to grow up as a kid. Yeah. I bet it was. Kill a mockingbird. We yeah. grew up on our family's ranch, uh, 70 miles north of Abilene in Stonewall County, desert, you know, arid mm. environment similar to your family's ranch. Mm-hmm. So I want to start out our conversation just kind of comparing childhood stories out mm. on the ranch. Tell us what your childhood was like. Sure. Well, my grandparents, my dad's side lived out in Gilbert, Arizona. And at that time, that was quite a stretch from like the downtown Phoenix area or Mesa. And there were just old concrete roads and drive through farmland. And so we go out there every Sunday to hang around and we would catch toads, toads hopping around all over the place. There were canals in the pond and horses and and we'd go feed the horses and and just get into trouble, like climb onto things (laughs) and break it or, you know, go smash bottles or whatever kids do, right? (laughs) Uh, but then my um, grandparents, was, uh, the Hansons, Ray, Ray and Marie Hanson, they uh, also had lots of farms down uh, in southwestern Arizona, about you know two hour drive from that Gilbert area. And one of them is is out there outside of Gila Band, which is a very 
historical place. It's one of the most historic places in really all the West where you have Native American uh, fingerprints all over it with their their culture. And then the Spanish came through and the Mexican, you know, so everything you think of with cowboys and Indians and and uh, homesteaders and massacres and all sorts of things happened out there. And I just fell in love with the history of the place. And so early on, I was out there looking for broken bottles or for money and buttons and metal detecting old, old stagecoach depots and and things like that, collecting whatever I could find out there and shiny rocks. And uh, and so I just grew up, you know, just knowing what the wilderness looked like, right? But dreaming of like buried treasure. There was a, a man who was a, ro- a county road grader down the road who had been there and he had found things like conquistador helmets and cannonballs. Wow. And he had this like museum out in his front yard. And so we would just, we go down to the ranch We'd want to go down to Agua Caliente and, and check out this stash. And then we drive back and be dark and there'd be like rattlesnakes in the road. <laughs> so it's just like, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I do think back once in a while that I think that my approach to life was shaped out there, right? Like it was a blank slate. It was do or die. There were no rules. I remember one time I was riding a horse that my grandpa had for me and we didn't ride the horse very much. Uh, and, uh, so it was a little bit wild and I got on it and he, the horse bucked me off and ran off. And it, it, when the horse, horse bucked me off, uh, the horse stepped on my leg. And so I was feeling hurt, but my grandpa came over and I thought he was going to maybe like give me a hug or something. He said, well, go get her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I had to limp and I don't think I ever ended up actually collecting that horse. But, um, but we grew up just like, you just, you just do it. And, uh, and it's fun. And, and, uh, you know, so anyway, I, I could go on for days on that topic, but just I got to see what the old West looks like and to experience freedom. Yeah, I love that. I love that for you. Yeah, we we had a lot more rules on our ranch than it sounds like you did, but our dad managed our family's ranch. So we had the daily chores, the horrid summer chores. I was mm. just complaining about it to my parents when we were home uh, planting hemp a few weeks ago, just saying like, there was always one chore every summer that was just like, it made you sick to your stomach to know that you're going to have to do it for one or two (laughs) weeks. And, you know, once we all were given machetes or clippers Mm -hmm. and it was, you need to trim up all of these mesquite trees. Mm. We don't want them to be bushes. If they're going to be here, we need them to grow up. So got dropped off at one cattle guard and (laughs) over the course of the week, worked our way up manicuring the wild Mm -hmm. mesquites. Um, One year it was the painting all the pipe fence. Or building fence. Building fence. Yeah, that was always a good one. But yeah, they build character. And I learned the art of the 10, 15 minute power nap. My great granddaddy Patterson would say, don't worry, the ground will catch you. (laughs) Don't, you're going to fall off that horse. Don't worry, the ground will catch you. And I, that, It's literally like where my life is. Like, don't worry. The ground will catch us. It doesn't matter what happens. It's going to be okay. Yeah. So I so badly want to get you out because I've got a job for you at my ranch. (laughs) Planting a bunch of mesquite. And we're trimming them up right now. So uh, we can use some help. So I I was going to talk about this later (laughs) on, but we can just talk about this now. Last year, I went to a talk. We were at the FARFA conference Farm and Ranching Freedom Alliance and Gary oh, Nabhan. Yes. Yep. Yes. I was listening to him talk about mm-hmm. water wars, how to grow regeneratively in the Southwest. Mm-hmm. And I bought a book from him that was all about how to profit from mesquite. Yep. Don't poison it, don't work against it, work mm-hmm. with it. And so I was curious. So when you took over, you were able to buy your family's Mm -hmm. ranch so that y'all didn't lose it. Spoiler alert, we skipped ahead. (laughs) And so I'm assuming your mesquite issue looked like our mesquite issue where you can barely see the ground. Was that this issue or did you literally just voluntarily plant mesquite when you didn't have any? You're going to think I'm crazy, but we planted it. Our, Our ground is so bad, like the the desertification out there, the climate is so bad that we're killing our mesquite trees. Mesquite trees don't grow. Salt cedar 
grown out in the middle of the river that's dry, they don't grow. Okay. So like if you can't grow mesquite, you can't can't grow salt cedar, you got a problem. Yeah. You've got climate change and a disaster. You got a broken water cycle on your hands, right? But um so there there have been some trees, mesquite trees that were already out there that had taken hold. But my grandpa was probably like your dad and grandpa too. He liked nice clean lines and cut down trees and bushes and you know, cut down anything that's not a ditch and a field, but maybe around the house, keep a few. But regenerative agriculture really is trying to bring back all sorts of um, species, including shade and bring in nurse trees and, and then bring back food. So we planted ironwood, mesquite, uh, and Palo Verde. I planted maybe 200 of those trees plus a bunch of Spanish heirloom trees. And then we did uh, conservation cover where we planted native forbs and grasses in an area. And very interestingly, after we got the native grasses and forbs in there, we got just a little bit of water on it. The birds brought in the mesquite trees. Yep. And so the place where I want to put you to work and I'll go along <laughs> with you is a place, it's like an eight acre stretch. And purely by accident, we have probably 300 mesquite trees out there. And, but of course they're planted in, or they, they grew close to each other and, and they're going to be bushy and, you know, so like you actually have to go in there and tend it. Mm-hmm. That's what I, I love the fact that you introduced me as a steward, right? Like mm-hmm. that, it turns out, and I'm learning this too, that mother nature will do her thing, but she wants our help. Yes. She wants us to be there and to groom her and to help yes. her and shape her a little bit. Right. Mm-hmm. And that goes for these mesquite trees. But now, I mean, I looked at the mesquite trees. Actually, I read all Gary Nabhan's materials. I've talked to him. He's, he's a friend and advisor down there. There's only a few people that really know that area really well. Jesus Garcia and Dina Cowan are a couple of others. But I read his book and I'm like, okay, well, who's doing it in Arizona? Yeah. Like he's writing about it, but who's doing it? Mm-hmm. Well, I decided to do it. You can tell I, I'm a doer. <laughs> yes. And so we planned a mesquite. We bought a, a hammer mill and we are a wild crafting organic mesquite operation and we turn it into our pancake and waffle mix <laughs> mesquite pancake waffle mix because people are emailing us all the time mm-hmm. like how do i get your mesquite flour yeah. we should just stop farming wheat which costs so much and just literally harvest mesquite we could sell that for whatever thirty dollars a pound Well, this is a conversation I've actually had with our family for several years when I was reading about it. And it's like, okay, it's a superfood. It's great for diabetics. Mm -hmm. You know, it has a low glycemic index. It's excellent for people that have celiac disease or something and they Mm -hmm. want an alternative. And it's naturally sweet. I I was making mesquite tea and selling it at the farmer's market when I first got here so I could meet people and... Um, I'm like, you're not a real Texan if you haven't drank mesquite tea. So that was my hook. But it's really delightful. So how are you harvesting it? What Mm -hmm. is your process? Because, you know, they're thorny little boogers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so we do trim them up um, in the off season so that they're easy to get under. And then uh, first year or two, we just did it by hand. We're picking it up. And second year and third year, we've been laying out tarps, staking okay. them on the ground. And then we would just kind of go and shake the trees a little bit. And the wind does howl through there. So then we could just pick it up. We have a whole protocol we developed uh, with our organic program where we will wash it and dry it in the sun. And then we will mill it up in our hammer mill. And that's a real fun process. He's talked about how sweet it is when you are milling the mesquite any bee from a hundred miles away yeah. will come. <laughs> they love that yeah. mesquite. Yes. When you are sun drying it, how long mm-hmm. are you doing? How long is that process? Just long enough to really dry it. Like we're just trying to wash it off, get the dust off of it, any sort of toxins, if it ends up touching the ground. Um, but it doesn't need long. And at this time of year, I mean, it comes on about May. And so it, it's going to be hundred degrees. And so just a day or two out there. And so when you're just, I mean, milling the whole thing Mm -hmm. that, yeah, the whole bean, the the shaft comes out. Mm -hmm. So it's got a really hard bean inside Mm -hmm. uh, that that dries and 
and there are actually these um, bugs can get in there. And so you have to like pick your time to mill it or you have to freeze it. There's like mm-hmm. a whole process, like a beetle, it can get inside to yeah. eat it up. Oh, yeah. But you just, um, you run it through a hammer mill, which just crushes it. And it just spits out the the hard chaff, which you can use as like a mulch yeah. also. Uh, and then you're left with this, you know, really delicious bean all smashed up. Well, and that, I don't know, cellulose inside of that, that fibery stuff, mm-hmm. that's part of the really sweetness of it. So yeah. thinking about, okay, how do we mm-hmm. use the whole thing? So you use it as mulch, but could you also... Do I'm anything sure. else food wise with it? Well, I mean, what comes out of the hammer mill, the flour part is the, the part that really we would eat. I mean, I think you could probably, you might be able to like steep it, for instance, right? Yeah. Take, yeah, take that tea. chaff, just put some hot water through it. I mean, you might, I might be throwing away the basis for a mesquite tea that you could bottle up, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Give it a shot. Yeah. Yeah. I know I can, yeah, I can go down the wormhole on mesquite and we have a thousand things we want to talk to you about. <laughs> well, but just, I want to take another minute on mesquite, okay, right? Good. Which is that <laughs> mesquite is like the regenerative climate change solution, right? Like here is a food that just grows like a weed. Yes. We don't have to do anything to it. We're not fertilizing it and it produces a superfood. Yes. Okay. Well, why are we cutting those trees down and Thank making you. barbecue out of them? Yeah. Okay. And most people yeah. want post oak. They don't even want the mesquite anymore. It's too hot. Yeah. <laughs> and so most people view it as a nuisance, mm-hmm. but it it has this this amazing food. And as long as it's the like the native mm-hmm. variety, it tastes really good. Yeah. It tastes like citrus. Each mm-hmm. tree is a little bit different. You can yeah. select your flavor of mm-hmm. mesquite. And then I don't know if you've tried our mesquite pancake mixes, but there's no flavor like that. We paired that up with the white Sonora wheat, you know, for 300 years, mesquite and white Sonora were probably growing right Mm -hmm. next to each other. They're like cousins, they're friends, right? It's this cuisine. It's something we've sort of forgotten about, right? A lot of regenerative agriculture is looking backwards to the indigenous wisdom and the history. And as far as I know, in fact, Archaeology Southwest, uh, Aaron Wright, their uh, one of our friends who actually helped us get our program going, he's written about mesquite and the historical connections to it. And the Native Americans would, in our region, they'd harvest millions of pounds of mesquite every year, and they would just eat that all year round. So if you're looking for a a food where you can get small amounts, nutrient dense, let's not look past the thing that's right here in our yard. And and I thought it's really interesting if you, for us, if you plant regeneratively, the the trees will come. And you can just now imagine putting that as like a hedgerow out in the middle of your field. Like it's a windbreak and it mm-hmm. can keep the wind from blowing your soil away while you're getting started. And so it's a very versatile tool to use. We ran the lab test on it because we're, we're run, making, you know, food and uh, it just had all these like vitamins and minerals that you just don't see in other foods. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. So what we're talking about here is a theme that runs through everything that you do and everything that we want to do, and that's reimagining agriculture. Mm -hmm. It's taking the, this is what my grandfather did and his grandfather did mentality and just like busting everything that we know, getting it all out of our head and rethinking about this with fresh eyes. And I know how, you know, when you drop an earring or something. And it's just like, okay, I'm looking everywhere. I can't find it. Someone else can just walk up and be like, oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. You know, so that perspective shift is so important. So what advice do you have for family farms who are in this situation similar to ours? You know, we are fifth generation members of our family. We have been ranching this property Since 1887, we're the oldest ranch in Stonewall County, Hmm. and now we're the first in Stonewall County that's growing hemp and doing it without any chemicals Mm -hmm. and any pesticides. So there are a lot of folks looking at us right now. Mm -hmm. So this is an episode that I will be sharing far and wide with everyone I know that is dry farming because that's what we Mm. have to do where we are. So to really make an impact and shift these people's perspective, like what advice do you have? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I have so I have more questions than I do answers, but I will just say that 
at least where I'm farming and a lot of the farmers that I know, like the status quo just ain't working. Right. And, and it's not getting better. Like farmers are getting poorer. People are getting sicker. The land's getting drier. Temperatures are getting hotter. We've developed all of our, a lot of our seeds to though they're little weaklings that need <laughs> herbicides and fertilizers to yes. grow, right? They don't have any mm-hmm. backbone to deal with the, the conditions we're throwing at them. Yeah. And, and we're seeing dust blow into our eyes and into the cities, right? Like we're losing our topsoil. And so it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out that this isn't working. It also, you look around, most of this country is planted in, in corn and soybeans, right? Um, GMO. Mm-hmm. And like we've got monoculture going and then we're eating that food, corn and soy in everything. And, and you start becoming almost like a conspiracy theorist. You're like, wait a minute. We're growing corn soy. We're we're supporting corn and soy because that's a cheap food that we can make anything out of. Like we're we're just getting fattened up like hogs. Yeah, it's we're not really mm-hmm. eating healthy food exactly. anymore. And so you got to have to like just reverse the whole thing. And and I do think that um, fresh eyes is needed are needed right now. Right, like I think that some of the people who can be probably the most helpful are people who have some humility, but who come in and they're just like okay, like, let's just take a look at this. Let's just problem solve for a minute. I'm just, a, I'm just observing what's going on here and it doesn't work. I mean, for me, it was yeah. really easy to just get into that spot where I had all these romantic attachments to this land and my grandpa spent his whole life on that land. And I know of the generations of people who live there and they're buried on my farm, actually, right? Yeah, Yet I sure. show up and we're in the middle of another dust bowl. I had some hydrologists, I had a hydrologist and some other experts come out to the farm as soon as I bought it. And I asked them a question. I said, on a scale from like zero to 10, zero being dead and 10 being alive, how much life is in this region, in this little ecosystem that I have going on here, 665 acres along the Gila River? And this hydrologist looked at me without, a, without any hesitation and said, yeah, you're like a one or a two. Mm. And um, that's dire. Okay. And, and then I started to assess the wells that we had. These are shallow wells, but they're old wells that were drilled like in the 50s. Uh, they had been neglected. And I tried to put them all back online. It took, cost me half a million dollars just to go through the wells, just to figure out what I even had. And we didn't get any more water. In fact, we had to abandon one of the wells. So I just realized I have less water it was always tight out there. We have less water and we have hotter temperatures. I have sterile soil. What am I going to do? And so like w- one idea would have been plant 80 acres of alfalfa Okay, on, on a 650 acre farm. I mean, you can't make a living off 80 acres of, of alfalfa. Yeah. So I had to look around for other alternatives. And, and luckily I went down to the mission garden in Tucson and I met um, Jesus Garcia and Dina Cowan who opened my eyes to desert agriculture. And I realized that we have this time capsule of foods that were brought through Spain, the Mediterranean, all of the goods that were collected over the years, they were brought to Mexico by the Spanish and brought up to Arizona. Uh, And we have forgotten about all these foods. And those are foods that got adapted to our region. And then you, and then you go beyond the, the Spanish to the Native Americans. They were growing agave and they were selecting for different agaves so that they grew faster and they used them as food and fiber. And so it just takes a different way. Like it's like, well, this just isn't going to work. What's another alternative? My wife and my daughter backed me into another box, which was, hey, whatever you do, it's got to be organic. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, let's what am I going to do? I, I, I had to pick the crop and then like there is an organic cotton. It doesn't make sense to do that. I went through the, kind of the obvious choices and, and I landed on wheat. I mean, I fall in love with white Sonora wheat. Um, it is America's first wheat. And as I've watched it, it is like this hardy rock star. You plant, plant it in the, in the salty soil. You stress it out. You kind of abuse it. It'll still grow. Because we're growing organically and regeneratively, we had all of these, and we're not tilling, we had all these volunteers from when we harvested in the summer. We, we planted cover crops into that same ground, and we gave it one dose of irrigation. 
And on that one dose of irrigation in the middle of the summer, 125 degree weather in Arizona, by the way, we got a grade two white snore we had off of that. That's unheard of. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's the one that like the universe is telling me, Dax, grow white snor wheat. Yes. That's your buddy. Mm -hmm. And then I look around and I've got all of these weeds growing out there. Most people say weeds. And I've got uh, invasive Bermuda grass because we, you know, we as a nation, we were trying to bring livestock out and then we brought all these invasive species out. Now we sort of like bastardized the whole environment. Well, most farmers would just put herbicide on it or they'd rip it and they'd disc it and they'd just, they're constantly fighting it. I looked at it and I said, okay, well, wait, this is food. Like you can make, you can fatten up a sheep on this and cattle. Mm -hmm. Like I've got all of this forage. And so sometimes you just have to like let go, right? Let go of what you want to do. And you go with the thing that the universe is telling you to yes. do. And for us, it's white snark. Then you got to get creative. Okay, what can you do with wheat? Most people want to sell for 25 cents. Most farmers stand out. They're like, hey, I, I grew this wheat. Who wants to buy it? You know, someone's like, well, I'll pay it 25 cents or 30 cents a pound. You can't make money off of that when you're yeah. pumping water out of the ground and paying electricity bills. Well, one thing you could do, you can make vanilla extract with it, mm -hmm. right? Like per ounce, that's the, the highest value way of using wheat. So we take this wheat when we're not focusing on yield at all flavor, mm -hmm. performance, and we distill it with the country's um, most awarded distillery, put it with fair trade, traceable, organic Madagascar vanilla beans in a barrel and you age the hell out of it. And then you end up with this delicious vanilla extract. Well, raise my vibration. Let's go. <laughs> I mean, I had no idea. So, I mean, ancient grains have been on the brain, but when I was reading about the white Sonora wheat mm -hmm. and the fact that it uses so much less water and mm -hmm. it just thrives in you, you mentioned salty soil and, you know, I perked <laughs> up and then, yeah. you know, little to no rain. And I'm like, okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about how this is performing versus the conventional wheat mm -hmm. that everyone else is growing right now. Yeah. Well, so on my farm, I mean, we, we, Got two heirloom varieties, one ancient variety, and one modern that we've even experimented with. Those are the only things that we've really grown. We've dabbled with a couple of other heirloom varieties trying to grow them out. So let's take red fife. It's, it's a hard red wheat that comes from more like the, the northern climate in, in America. People love that one as, as compared to a soft white, which is the white sonora. Well, that red fife doesn't grow nearly as well. Like it struggles... You don't get as much of a yield. We stress it out to where it has a really interesting flavor. Like you get these flavor profiles in it. But what that's telling me comparatively, it's like red fife belongs up north. We shouldn't be growing it yeah. down there, right? The um, Bluebeard Durham, we brought that in from Iraq. It, it came out of the USDA collection. And you'd think that that would grow because it grows in the desert. It grew okay, but, you know, it not as well as the white snore weed. So it's like, well... I don't know that I want that one. And and so I'm I'm probably gonna scratch that one from my my list. And then we 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 I fell in love with the whole model, the the grain economy up in Skagit Valley, Washington. You know, since we have one foot on Bainbridge Island, Washington, and and one down in Arizona, just because, you know, it would kind of skip this part, but like I became a lawyer rather than being a farmer <laughs> and and I spent time in Japan, so I need to be on the Pacific Rim. So I've raised my family on um, Bainbridge Island in the Pacific Northwest. But then you've know, got these ties to Arizona took over the family farm. Um, and it, so I spent time down there. But um, there's a really interesting story with these tulip farmers who were using wheat as a as a cover crop, a rotation crop for them. But it was just getting sick. It had stripe disease and all sorts of other things in it. And um, Dr. Stephen Jones and Stephen Lyon from the WSU Bread Lab came in and they said, well, we're going to develop you a modern variety of a wheat that actually is suited to your climate, but we're going to go beyond just like its suitability. We're going to make it so that it's, it's intended, it's a wheat that's intended to be used in whole grain applications, like rather than scraping off all the bran and the germ, let's like use the whole thing and for flavor. And so they call that a modern genoplasm. So it's been bred. So it's got bearded and unbearded, short and tall. It's like this really interesting wheat and it tastes amazing. And, uh, I said I'd grow that. And by the way, that's, all the things that I grow uh, are like open 
varieties that don't require like a license. Like that's yeah. not a patented seed. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of anti patented yeah. seed. Yeah. Let's just yeah. grow the things and keep your own seed and, and store it back up. So that, that Skagit also doesn't grow nearly as well. But my, my belief on that is that it was first of all built for the Pacific Northwest. We've kind of trained it to the Southwest. Uh, but it also is a modern variety that was um, developed for herbicides and fertilizers and all the rest. Right. And so you just, for me, you just can't really compare that to the, the heirloom varieties or the ancient varieties. Um, I I'm growing it cause it tastes good. And I decided to pair that up in my bread mixes. So you've got like a powerful modern variety of wheat that was intended for health and an heirloom variety. But what, I, what I've realized is notwithstanding 18 months of like product development of, of, on the bread side, I could have done better. Like I could, I, I could actually have made just white Sonora work. In fact, we've made white Sonora work all on its own. And at least I'm finding that like our target demographic, they like the idea that it's a hundred percent heirloom wheat that hasn't been bred yeah. at all. Like B-R-E-D. Right? It has, I'm like, yeah. no pun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, and, um, and so like, I think we maybe are actually cutting out some of our customers by mm-hmm. like putting a modern and a, heirloom variety because we just weren't, you know, talented enough to make it, you know, work. And, and by the way, I'm betraying my, my prejudice here too for whole grain. Yeah. Like the, a lot of people just want to eat wheat that's been refined, right? You take out some of the brand and germ off of it because it's easier to work with. But then you get rid of all that nutrition, you get rid of all the terroir. Mm-hmm. And so I'm kind of on a whole grain kick to just tell people either if you want my wheat, yeah. Grown regeneratively with the best terroir in Arizona, you're going to get it whole grain. Good. If you don't want that, then go to somebody else. Wonderful. Because yeah. Yeah. this is what you get here exactly. at the very best. I will tell you that my farm manager, Yadi Wong, who's a PhD in plant science and water science, and everything, he'll just tell me, like, wheat's not the right place to start. Okay. And that's why I, 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 we got in, kind of down this road. And I tell you, I love white Sonora, which I do. But white Sonora may only be our solution short term. Okay. Like the, when you've got rundown ground mm-hmm. that's salty and nothing else can grow on. In fact, the more we've brought biodiversity back mm-hmm. to the land, the more the white Sonora struggles. Okay. Oh, yeah. Like it mm-hmm. wants to be out there just in the middle of like, you know, bare dirt. Yeah. So okay. is it because your soil is changing? Our soil is changing, but, but I guess that the, and I, this is where you're going to get way past my the scientific knowledge here, but there's things like C2 plants and C4 plants and characteristics and how they like uh, what they do to the soil, like building up the soil or tearing it down, taking mm-hmm. nutrients out. And wheat is like a, it's like a scavenger. Like it takes things out. It doesn't put things back in. Right. Like alfalfa puts things back in. Right. And yeah. we plant cow peas and all sorts of other things. So we grow the wheat, but then we have to put all sorts of things back in with cover crops and then put the cattle on there and the green manure. But if you had, I think there's things like millet and sorghum, right? Other grains, which are not as common for us here uh, in our diet, but those those varieties of grain actually do improve the ground, right? Interesting. So, I didn't know that wheat yeah. doesn't play well with others, but the sorghum and yeah. millet are healthy options. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, you know, just thinking about the diversity of what we plant and Mm -hmm. why we plant it. So when you say that it's exhausting the soil, Mm -hmm. what is your current process? So what do you, so you've planted wheat, you harvest it, then what are you putting Mm -hmm. on that soil after that? Yep. Yep. So we plant wheat in the winter. So like December ish, uh, we harvest that in like June or July. And then we turn right around and we plant all sorts of other cover crops in there. And it's and these cover crops primarily have been to build soil. So it's been cow peas, like nitrogen fixers. And then since we have uh, all of this Bermuda grass, we're trying to shade the Bermuda grass out. So you've got some broad leaves that we're planting, right? So we're, so we're testing all sorts of different cover crops, mm-hmm. like 25 different species in at there once. In, in, yeah. at once in, in trying different mixed compositions, different places. And then we've been let that grow up. And then we've been putting the sheep on and the sheep come and they eat the cover crop. 
And then you plant the wheat back in in the winter again. Mm -hmm. Um, We would like to get to a point where we do other things. Like we could grow garbanzo beans, right? We would love to grow a bunch of vegetables, for instance, right? And uh, so all of a sudden you start getting more options. The really interesting thing is that right now we're growing wheat and barley because, I mean, people eat things like bread and pancakes. I thought, well, that's a good place to start. So you've got white Sonora. But over time, maybe our farm ends up being an agave farm. Maybe it ends up being a, a permaculture with olives, right? And and we can plant heirloom citrus and um, grapes and pomegranate, right? And so I think that you know, one of the hard parts about having a brand open yeah. farms were like, we're pancakes, yeah. right? <laughs> like, we, like we, we literally, I'm biased, but like we literally have the most nutritious and most delicious pancakes you can buy on the market. 100% whole grain, fluffy, white pancakes. And so people are like, well, let's lean in. Like Open Farms is like a, like a breakfast company. But like, what if we end up being an olive company? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, what if that's easier? Like our ground's going to change. Like we want the ground to change. Yeah. And and so I I think that back with sort of busting norms and back like bringing new eyes to the equation, it's like, well, what are we? Well, first of all, I mean, I'm a conservationist. I I think more before I'm a farmer, like I'm trying, I'm trying to save a piece of ground that I love. I'm trying to save a lifestyle that I love this romantic farming, ranching, the things that you were taught as girls to do, I mean, would break most teenagers these days. They don't make them like they used to. They don't make them like (laughs) they used to. Right. And so like, for me, it's about, okay, well, I want my kids and my grandkids to know how to do that. And there's no way to learn how to do that in a vacuum. You got to do it. And if you can do it on site where your grandpa did it and your grandma made cheese and she dried uh, raisins on a window screen. Yeah. Okay. Then these kids know where they come from. They know who they are. They know what their morals are. And so for me, it's about conserving that way of life more than food, right? Yeah. And, and so that's where it's like, you know, like, so maybe I'll never be successful as the pancake company, but, but I will have a farm that people will flock to and generations of, of the Hanson family will come to and they'll ride horses and they'll get bucked off <laughs> and that's all worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So you were able to do this because you were told like we were. I don't want this life for you. You don't want this life. This is too hard. Go out and be a doctor or a lawyer or a banker. And you became a lawyer. Lawyer. So you were able to have the means Mm -hmm. to be the one in your family to save the ranch. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we don't have that. (laughs) Congratulations. Yes. Good for you. So happy for you. So Whenever you're talking about like, oh, you know, okay, this is who we are now, but this may, maybe one day we'll grow citrus or we'll do this. I can literally see my dad swerving off the road. (laughs) (laughs) So it's just like, you know, what I'm hearing you say is I'm willing to pivot at every turn. And that is something that is so hard to get farmers who are 60 plus Mm -hmm. to be willing to make that pivot. So I appreciate this conversation. I'm going to ask you a few more questions about the way you're planting stuff, because right now we're, we're at this place of, okay, we're asking you to make a turn from traditional Mm -hmm. ag. So the tools that you're using, are you still plowing your fields or is it a no-till seed drill that you're using? Like- oh, yeah. I mean, I, I went cold turkey, right? But but keep in mind, I've got a different situation than farmers who have existing operations. What, by the time I bought my farm, it had been essentially fallowed for almost 10 years, a lot of it. It had been run down. I mean, to my, I thought that was a real detriment, right? Like everything had been scavenged off that farm. The ditches were broken, full of dirt, nothing growing. The house was torn down. People stole all the well equipment. Okay. So that, that's just, you know, that's a liability at that point. But the one silver lining is that there were no chemicals anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it was really easy to get that organic certified. Okay. Yeah. There wasn't a transition. It was a rebuild. 
So if you're going to transition, there's probably a, a different strategy there, kind of phase it in over time, uh, as opposed to like just, you know, going kind of where we do it. But, but I just, when I decided we were going to just rebuild that land, I looked around for the tools and the practice, like, like how do you basically, how do you rebuild land that's almost dead? For regenerative agriculture, I mean, the definition of it is to like bring, breathe new life into land. And there were organizations like the Regenerative Organic Alliance that had been started by Patagonia and Dr. Bronner's and the Rodell Institute, who knew something about brands and knew something about the wilderness, knew something about farming, organic agriculture, who said, here's what you do. And I looked at that standard and realized, okay, well, that's the playbook for how to build this back up, right? And it's going to be no-till. So we had to get a no-till drill from the Midwest. They don't have no-till dr- no drills in Arizona. We had to get a roller crimper from the Midwest. Mm-hmm. There's no roller crimping going on in Arizona. It's all you're ripping and you're disking, exactly. right? Exactly. And so there's a lot of equipment that we use when we just first try to get the, the fields um, tidied up to plant. That we honestly don't need anymore, like a land um, plane and other things that we should sell because we're, we're not going to, like, I'm not going backwards on that. We've What we've realized is that we, the more we've gone to uh, till, like even light tillage, like we've gone backwards on the soil, like biology. Mm-hmm. And so you should leave it there. Yeah. I've been, I'm at least embracing that. And I think even if I walk away, like I say, okay, well, we're not going to farm anymore because it's too expensive. You know, the markets aren't there for our products. I could literally walk away and the life would continue out there. Yes. We did a tally. And in the last three years, we think we brought back 150 new species to, to our nice. land. Seven different kinds of grasshoppers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so it's there. Now, Now even if it we don't irrigate it and it rains, mm-hmm. we've got all this. And we got trees now growing and birds are coming in. Yes. So like it, like I've probably done... Half of my job, which is pull it out of the fire. Yeah. Okay. Now there's more. And back to like being flexible to me, it's like, well, you just, you listen to what the earth is telling you. I mean, I don't want to pivot. It would be, I mean, it'd be so much easier to just like find the thing that makes money and just keep doing that. But the earth is where all of the bounty comes from. And so you got to like read the signs from the earth yeah. and you kind of get the hand you're dealt. Mm-hmm. And, and you play it. Uh, if I was going to do it again, I don't know that I would have jumped right into wheat. I mean, I think that I would have just taken advantage of all of this grass that I had out there and I would have just planted, I would have raised cattle, rebuild the soil, maybe even change the soil chemistry Yeah. Uh, before I, I grow that. Um, we're growing some barley now too, right? We're, we're varying. And I don't know that I would have, to do it over again, I would have jumped right into as big, biggest scales I did. It's just that that's the way I operate. Like yeah. that, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it all the way. And honestly, we're still trying to find the path of like viability there. But um, uh, and that's why that context matters, right? And and that the, you should decide what you grow. I mean, we could have a whole other conversation about like well, what should you grow based on your soil. I look at things like ethnobotany, like well, what used to be growing on this land. Okay. Yes. I look at the climate change reports. Okay. Well, what is going to happen to this climate? Like there's a whole swath of the, this country where like it's getting hotter. And so people are already making plans to start moving up North. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't want to leave this land. You guys don't want to leave this land. You've been here since the 1870s or whatever, mm-hmm. you know? And, and so it's like, we should make it work. Yes. Um, so, so can but, we focus in yeah. on that for a second? Because sure. You know, everyone that we know, they're commodity farmers. Yeah. This the direct to consumer idea is new and it sounds like a lot of work, a lot of hard work to them. And, you know, for me, I'm like, it appears to me mm-hmm. that your opportunities for return are a lot higher and there is a lot of diversification of where you can make money. Mm-hmm. Even from the tourism piece of it, people coming in and giving tours, doing education stuff, things that don't even have to do with farming Mm -hmm. where you can make money. But focusing on someone shifting from the commodity market to wanting to do a direct to consumer thing, Mm -hmm. you partnered with a sheep farmer. You don't have the sheep, right? Yeah, yeah, not now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my thing is creating these collaborations within your community. Is there how does that work for you? Do you have mm-hmm. contracts with these people? Do you, is there a profit sharing? Like, how does that work? 
Well, let me just in context to say like we have been, we brought out to the farm chicken manure, organic chicken manure spread that. Well, one truckload of that chicken manure or enough to take over fields. It was like, it was actually multiple truckloads, but like one season, like we probably spent $30,000 on chicken manure. Okay. To spread out there. All right. So what if instead of bringing chicken manure out and compacting your ground, you just ran a bunch of sheep out there. Not only are they giving us your, their manure, but they're giving us their urine too. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. That's creating all this back. So, so I looked at that and said, okay, if I just get sheep out there on the fields, I like I've saved thirty thousand dollars, right? And um, and so honestly, like I've been probably going about all of this backwards. I mean, literally, probably everything I've done, including like the way I developed the the consumer package good CPG food brand, was all backwards in the way most people do it. But for me, it's like, well, let's find a model, like a viable model somewhere. Like if it can't be just me. Well, maybe me plus a rancher could make it work. And what if the rancher can make some money? Well, maybe they can't make money if it's just me growing a rate sheep and they give me a little bit of money because they're selling it at auction. But what if they have a USDA processing facility and they make regenerative organic certified meat sticks? Okay. And you sell that at the market. Can they pay me more on that? Probably. And so I committed to essentially two years of, of, a, of a project with his Hartquist um, Hollow Family Farms. And, um, we we brought in their sheep and we're just trying to figure like can either one of us make money on this like it it can benefit the land if you manage the sheep yeah. okay if you just leave the sheep to their own devices they will denude the land sure. and they make it worse right and so back to you know got to take you got to trim the trees you got to also move the animals right like yeah. that's just like what stewardship means mm-hmm. uh, so I don't know I mean and honestly we have not at Oatman Flats Ranch like we have not found the model that covers all the expenses. But what I have figured out is that um, on a per unit level, like call it the, a, a bag of pancake mix or a bottle of vanilla extract that we make the spirit from with our wheat, if I could sell all of it that I make, then I will make enough money to take care of the farm because I built the farmer's cogs, their actual cost of, of growing, all their expenses into that pricing model. Okay, now currently I'm facing significant resistance on that, right? Like people are like that's too expensive, and the answer is yes, it's too expensive because the alternative is using subpar ingredients, yeah. right? Like we built food like food, substances, yeah, <laughs> food like substances, right? And so it's like, well, which do you want? And and right now the consumer education is lagging. Nobody knows how to make a, a judgment call between Oatman Farms pancake mixes and fill in the blank standard cheap variety. Yeah. Okay. They don't know. Well, we're going to get to the point where like just with a QR code or something, you can scan and you can f- get the nutrient density information about that. You can come up with a, a unique profile based on your genome, your health needs. Like, Hey, I, I'm selecting for this nutrient and I don't want that nutrient. And you can just go scan the grocery aisle. And my guess is that over time, a lot of those things that are in, in boxes on the stores, they're going to, even in the produce aisle, they're going to just fade away because there's nothing in them. Right. And so when you get the real McCoy out there, people will like start just buying that. And so I, I, I'm starting to shop that way. I just go buy Regenerative Organic certified products. I buy the milk, Alexander Family Farms, and then I buy Origin Milk Cheese, then I make my open farm because I've got all the wheat, right? And I eat Alex ice cream. And all of a sudden, wow, I'm feeling pretty good. Real food. Yeah, it costs a little bit more, but I hope that my medical bills go down. Yeah. I mean, what we haven't talked about is health. Mm-hmm. I have type 2 diabetes. I have lipodystrophy, okay, that causes me to have type 2 diabetes. I have type 1 diabetes in my family. My, my son diagnosed at age 10. My mom's type 1 diabetes. I have two nieces type 1 diabetes. Those two girls have celiac disease. Okay, well... When's enough is enough on that. Like that I think if you just go back to painting fences, yeah. eating real food and exercising, you can get out of that medical bind. And that's what kind of where I am. I'm just figuring out, okay, well, how am I going to change my lifestyle? Because actually that I need the farm probably more than the farm needs me. <laughs> yeah. Like I need to be bending down and squatting and picking stuff up and driving, putting my leg over my saddle on my horse, grunting. I need that. I mean, yeah. I'm almost 52 years old and I've been sedentary 
as, as a lawyer for, for too, far too long. But the food, good food's got to go along with it. If, he, yeah. if I work hard and eat bad food and drink bad water and bad air, I'm going to die anyway. And that's honestly the story of most of our farmers these days because they live out on a ranch somewhere on a farm, but they're dealing with agrochemicals and they're drinking toxic water. Yeah. Uh, in, in if many they cases. drink water. What's that? If they drink water. Yeah, if they drink, if they're drinking the milk <laughs> that, that's been, in many cases, right, grown with alfalfa that has glyphosate all mm. over it. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it definitely is a poisoned food system. And what we do, it's the local vor mentality. So buying your meat and dairy and eggs from your community, mm-hmm. knowing your farmer. I think that's one of the most important things because then you're willing to pay a little bit more yeah. because you know your farmer. You're supporting a family. Your you know she or he has integrity. Kids. You know yeah. you ask him questions like, "Did you spray?" No, I mean I'm not organic, but I'm not. You know, it's all just my grass. You can see it, right? So yes, absolutely. Well, and that's the other thing too. It costs a lot of money to get organic certified. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the regenerative organic certification if that is. Mm-hmm more expensive Mm -hmm. than the regular, but a lot Mm -hmm. of farmers can't afford these programs. So they may have good farming practices, but they don't have the label to go along with it. Mm -hmm. So you just have to be willing to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure that it pays yet either, right? I mean, it it is more. And I want to loop back to this money issue for a second, right? And privilege, because it's it's an important part of my story, which is I was the only one in my extended family that had the wherewithal to buy the farm because there's like just even owning a farm is expensive, right? Just to own it and pay the yeah. taxes on it, and then if you run any power, you know, also like it's just a liability. And I recognized that having another job, a partner in a law firm, where I, I make money practicing law, uh, gives me an advantage that most farmers don't have. I will say that m- many farmers and many farming families, they have two jobs. Like that's the way they're making it work. It's just that I end up, I have a higher paying job. So I just recognize that as a fact, right? Which is that I took a bunch of money from practicing law and I bought a farm and then I started getting into the regenerative and I went ahead and I just embraced things like the regenerative organic certifications and paying for lab tests and hiring a PhD environmental scientist to work for me as my farm manager and all the rest, right? Um, And most people can't do that. But the reality is I can't do it either, right? Like I could do it. I'm in my sixth year. But like this issue of like regenerating land, like taking land that's been depleted and putting it back online and trying to grow, grow it the right way is essentially impossible. Okay. I mean, it, it, like, I, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but I'm just saying like, it's you and I are both up against like an almost impossible situation. And the only way I can afford to do it again, or to c- continue to do it is either I make a lot of money practicing law or the consumers come to the rescue, right? Like it's a movement. And the the systems, of even like the way you discover food on the grocery store shelves and how it's distributed, those are all built around an old system yes. that results in the farmer getting seven to eight cents of every food dollar and everybody else getting more, including advertising and you know, buying social media. So even direct to consumer sounds nice, right? Like you, that for us, if we sell a product in a grocery store, we might make a dollar a of profit. If we sell it on our website, we make five, but we sell it that same price, right? Uh, Okay. Well, that works pretty good. Or maybe you make less than, we make 25 cents in the grocery store. Well, that's not enough to run a business. We have to change literally the whole system. And I don't believe we can change a system from the middle or like the far end. You got to start from the ground up. And that means you get people like you and me on the ground planting the right seeds, the right sort of crops, in the right sort of ground, taking care of the land stewardship, the soil health, build a product that's resilient, and then you got to harvest it, store it, clean it with the right sort of mentality, turn it into products that people like, and then you got to get it into the right hand. And, and, I, and that's the piece where we need big food to help us, but I don't know if the big food is want. I don't, think, don't know, I don't know if they know how to help us, yeah. even if they wanted to help us. And so it's to, to me, it's like more of a, like we have to build the alternative. Consumers don't know they have the alternative. 
but like the internet helps us find it. Instagram helps us find it. Your podcast helps people find it. Right. And once people find it, they will become, if it's if, like, if we do our jobs, right. We get consumers who are loyal for life. Yeah. Right. Change it their life. They'll be loyal for life. Yeah. And I feel like we are leading from the middle because it's like, we have the mentality, we have an idea, we know enough to be dangerous, mm -hmm. but it's like bringing along the rest of the farmers and then educating the consumers and just kind of like pulling them both in. And I don't think, I mean, and I try to do this too. Like, I don't think you can solve the whole thing. Like, it's like find a scope that you can manage and lean into that. Mm-hmm. And like, what can you control? Well, you can control your ground. Like you can control a piece. You maybe you get 80 acres, you plant a hemp on and you can grow that regeneratively, right? That can be a successful crop. By the way, the first crop I grew was, it was Sudan grass, right? Which is fed to cattle. I lost money on that crop, but I've, I've been losing money on the whole business, right? Yeah. So like, what does it matter if you're, you're gaining something? Like you're gaining knowledge, you're building your soil health, right? You've got the hemp. And so control that. And then it's like, well, okay, now what do you do? next right well maybe you get somebody who got some animals right and, and somebody who or maybe you guys go buy some of your own animals right you, you you and then you go to a market one of the steps i skipped was going to farmers markets right like i went right to build the best products make a cpg get it in grocery stores hire a broker get it out everywhere what i realized is mm, you know actually i don't make very much money that way and it's really hard to manage that process what if i literally just grew something took it to my local market and I was able to talk to people about it and why it's different. So I'm leaning in and we're not making that much money uh, at it, making, you know, sometimes like $300 a farmer's market. That's, that's not profit. That's literally like, Oh that's yeah. We've been to sales, farmers market. Yeah. The sales you made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we now have a bunch of loyal followers who know what we're doing. And, and sharing that with other sharing people. Sharing that with people. Right. So, so you start there, but um, I just, came back literally this afternoon from a impact CEO conference. And the theme of that conference was partnerships. Okay. And I, I, I just don't think that e any of us can just do it on our own. I mean, I, I partnered up uh, with one of your locals here in, outside of Dripping Springs in Dripping Springs, uh, Texas, James Brown from Barton Springs Mill. He mills my flour, my wheat into flour. Well, he did that because I didn't have an organic mill partner in Arizona at all. He doesn't want to do that for me forever, but he'll do it. Karen Spring Mills up in Washington State did the same thing for me in the short term. So that's where it's like, well, okay, well, you know, you, you do the best you can, find a partner. Your partner might be in a different region, but as long as they share your same DNA, one plus one can equal three, right? And th so just, I, I think you can find it your way through there. I know you're... You probably are aspirational like me and you want to do it all, but like do as much as you can and then pray and scrap and negotiate as much as you can to get what you want. Yeah. And, you know, the collaboration piece, the finding partners, that is how my brain works. I was a solopreneur for a long time and mm. that's the recipe for disaster. So, yes, having more people on the team is absolutely the answer. My family is my dad and uncle are selling the cattle herd and we're like we need a mm. faction we do, we don't want to lose them so there's a partner in mind who likes grass fed my dad's a big grass guy mm -hmm. so having the cattle stay on the land is important to us yeah. so we are figuring out a a way to collaborate where it could be something where bringing them into a direct to consumer mm -hmm. model along with us and yeah. having the grains, they have a little local grocery store mm -hmm. in the town. So it's like we could just start really small direct to consumer and having, you know, grass fed hemp finished beef and, and ancient grains and that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. yeah, it takes a lot of people mm -hmm. having an open-minded view of what this could look like. And so I appreciate that you're already doing that and that you've been very candid that, you know, this isn't a get rich quick scheme. <laughs> well, what I'm finding is, is that I'm a little bit spoiled, right? Like as a lawyer, like I actually can make money on what I do. And as I talk to more of these, even these like food company 
you know, like investors and others, you're kind of like a unicorn if you make a lot of money in that space, right? Yeah. So I, I think that agriculture and food, it's almost like philanthropy. <laughs> like that you're you're doing it because you care about people. Yes. You're doing it because you care about health. Like it's it's another way of you know, providing like nursing and like medical advice. And, and so there's all sorts of other reasons that are valuable. It's just that like, it's not putting more money into the system. And we have an extractive mentality. We have had an extractive mentality. You got to pay it back somehow. So it's either going to be sweat equity or money. And I don't know exactly where we get it, but if we don't get it, everybody suffers. And so like, uh, I, I do think that everybody, no matter what they do in life, like whatever they're calling, whatever their business is, their profession, they need to be looking at this. Like if they want a life for their, in the future, like, okay, like you got to spend some of your time. It's actually, it's like an obligation. I, I was talking about this today and on this panel, how do you get regenerative thinking into business? Well, regeneration actually isn't a business activity. Regeneration is it's like an obligation. It's it's a conservation effort. It's a paying back of old debts, right? But you need business prowess to apply to you know those solutions, and you can actually probably make money off of the solutions that work. Especially as more people turn around, like my farm is not producing. Yeah. Okay. Well, then what do I do? Well, even just like what you learn, the consulting services is very valuable. Just and a lot of farmers who are doing regenerative agriculture, like they're making money off of like telling people how to do it or writing books about it yeah. as opposed to selling a product. Can you just give your um, quick analogy of what these fertilizers and stuff are to the seeds? Yeah. Yeah. They're like drug addicts. So the, what these plants are supposed to do like before we like screwed them up is you plant them in some soil. There's some life in there, like bacterial and like fungal activity and there's other plants and things that are down inside there. And they like they have like these these like networks of it's like mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal I will get all the terms wrong. Mycorrhizal. Mycorrhizal. Fungi. Yeah. They, they, they got all these connect they, these networks, like the internet down underneath the ground. And sun comes down and and with um with uh, starches and they all connect. And 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 it's that it's the fungal activity and the bacterial activity that actually allows those plants to unlock the minerals that are in the ground it's not what you spray on them right mm-hmm. that they're supposed to go out there and like forage the plants have this symbiotic relationship with the with the fungi and the and the and, and the bacteria that give them all the nutrients and um and so when we go through now it, it, you know we just with the green revolution we figured out hey like let's accelerate this. Like this is going too slow. You know, like we, let's get more, like we got greedy. We want more. Like, and people thought, well, we're, it's war. Like we're dealing with famine, but rarely I think we've got greedy. Okay. So let's, so let's, let's find us like some weird mutant wheat from Japan, some small thing. And let's breed it with this other thing. That's got like big heads. So we selected this thing that was like a freak of nature and the only way it works is you put fertilizer on it and then herbicides because like you, it doesn't have natural defenses anymore, right? And so like we, we start putting all the the these chemicals on it. So but those chemicals and glyphosate, they, it actually kills all of the activity going oh, on right. in the soil. And then we just try to substitute by just putting like nutrient like liquid fertilizer on the top. And so when you develop a seed that year after year is in that environment. Where it's just like, you know, looking up for rain, you know, just get, getting the, the fertilizer coming in its mouth. That's supposed to looking down below where it's supposed to be getting it. Then you stop, you know, actually spraying that fertilizer on it. And then it doesn't know what to do. There's nothing in the ground, by the way. It doesn't know where to go look. It becomes weak, as, as I understand it, right? And so when you just like say, hey, toughen up, kind of like your dad and your grandparents <laughs> or whatever, like made you guys work. It's like, okay, so go look. Like there's there's stuff down inside there in the ground. Go find it. We're going to bring some life back. And and then over time, they th- those seeds start to like get nutrients the right way. And then they grow real food that we can harvest. Kind of sounds like the barn cats. <laughs> if you feed them, they're not going to do their job. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, I appreciate you. I know you have had such a long day. Thank you for ending it here with us. Is there anything that we didn't ask you that you feel is 
important to round out this combo? Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, I guess I would just say, first of all, like I really do care deeply about the regenerative movement. So like shout out to my friends at uh, Kiss the Ground, for instance, you know, um, Ryland and and um, Finian and others. And by the way, they're here in Texas. Uh, they're doing God's work, really, right? Yeah. They're spreading the good word. Um, the Regenerative Organic Alliance. You know, there's, there's a lot of people who are, who have figured out you know, the combination with the science works, right? And they're, they're getting the, the word out there. And so I am optimistic that we have the answers. We just need to have the backbone to go with it. And um, so maybe a, a call out here is just that if you're listening and you've got the ability to help a regenerative farmer in any way, yes, those farmers need your help. Yes. And whether you're a business person, you, you, you run a business, you run a retail grocery store or whatever it is, reach out and find a farmer and give her or him you know, a big hug and just ask, what can I do to help you? Right? Sometimes they need capital. Sometimes they need a partnership. But we are creative beings, right? We're pretty ingenious. We can come up with solutions. We, could, we can work ourselves out of difficult spots. If we can go to the moon, we could figure out this solution here on this rock. And so all I'd say is at the end on a positive note is that this is the most important work. I mean, I, I am doing this work not because I'm going to get rich off of it. I'm going to get poor doing it, poorer doing it. But it is probably the most important work that I can do. And we need the best and brightest. I would say it's an aging industry. We have a lot of older people in ag. Uh, and I think the only way to entice the young people, like the brilliant people back into ag, is through regenerative agriculture where they know there's a place for them to survive, right? Like they, they could thrive, they could build businesses, they can be healthy, they could let their kids run around on the on the ground and and not get sick. And so I just a shout out to the two of you for just jumping in and doing it with such grace and I guess excitement. I'll be watching your progress with um, Beta Breath. Well, we're going to put you on speed <laughs> dial for when we have questions. Anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So everyone who's listening is going to go to Oatman Farms and support Dax's business. Get some mesquite pancake mix. I'm or- ready to try that one. I did the Skagit and the white Sonora bread, bread the other night. It is absolutely delicious. It'll fill you up and make some of the best toast. Oh, it's so good. And then anybody who likes whipped cream or if you mm-hmm. like um, like strawberry shortcake, our vanilla extract is pretty amazing. And that's now for sale on our website. Excellent. Nice. I'll and be that looking is for that. oatmanfarms.com. Dot com. Yep. Easy peasy. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thanks for hanging out. It's my pleasure. Connect with the Soil Sisters at txsoilsisters.co. Submit questions, guest or show ideas, and sponsorship inquiries. The Soil Sisters podcast was created and produced by Joanna Newding. Editing and sound design are in the capable hands of the PodConnects Podcast Network.